Hello, my front porch friend. Well, I have been digging and digging, and I'm still digging. In fact, I'm just gonna take a break long enough to talk to you, and I've gotta get back to work. So you can see, once again, I am in an unusual place for us, but I'm here for a reason, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. You know, this is actually very unusual for me, and you know that. Uh, in fact, I guess this is the first time I think I've ever done this on the porch. But the word that I'm hearing for us today is the continuation of the word that I heard for us last week, only with greater insight. And here's what I'm feeling. In fact, I don't even know how to tell you how strong this word is burning in my spirit, like in an unusual, very significant way. This word that we've heard concerning, it's time to dig ditches. Now, here's what I don't want us to do. We cannot just hear a word from God that is so clear and just brush past it and change the subject until we have finished the task that he's given us to do. And that's what this is about. Now, let's just get started. I want to tell you some of the things that, that he's been revealing to me over these past few days of working and pondering this word. I want you to notice how all through, throughout the Bible, you'll see it scattered throughout. There were specific times when people were just believing for something from God. I mean, just something only God can do. That many times he would give them a very specific instruction, uh, an assignment, a command, something they had to do as an act of faith before they saw the manifestation of what they were asking for or believing for. Now, this is important. When God does this, it is never about us earning anything from God because we can never earn God's favor, you know? The other thing is this too. It's also not about his love for us whenever we are doing things like this to receive something from God. Whenever, whenever we are acting in obedience to something God's told us to do, it has nothing to do with how much he loves us what we do or do not do never changes his love for us. So this is not about love, but it is about how your faith is demonstrated. And that is very important to God. Now, here's the deal. When you read throughout the Bible, you'll notice this. I'm gonna go down here because it's getting noisy. I'll tell you about that in just a second. Whenever you look through the Bible and you begin to notice how many times God did this. It's fascinating because it's not every time that God tells people to do a certain thing first. It's not every time. It's just sometimes. And I even love that about God. I love the way he works differently because you can't box him in and neither can you formulize his ways. Now that's important for you to know that. You can never box God into a certain way of doing things and you can never formulize his ways. And I think that's because God's desire for us is that we would live in such a relationship with him, such an intimacy with God, that we just live every day so utterly dependent on his voice and what he's saying to us. He wants that for us. He wants to de us to depend on him every day. So he may do this something one way today, and he may do it completely different tomorrow. You just gotta know, while God never changes, his ways do, right? Now, there were some times though, and I, and I love to read about these times, when God would give his people a specific instruction or a command. Sometimes he would give them a promise and then a command before the promise was fulfilled. And that command in the middle was critically important to whether or not or when that promise would be fulfilled. For instance, think about Moses. Moses, in fact, all through his story, but let's just look at one. You've got the Red Sea in front of him. He's got the Egyptians behind him. What's God's instruction? God's promise to him is, I'm going to deliver you. His instruction was, lift up your rod. So that's what Moses had to do first. His, he had to do something. God didn't go down there and go, ooh, got to split that Red Sea. They're in trouble. No. First, Moses, lift up your rod. 
I love that. He, and, and, and he didn't need everybody. He just needed one man. God has to have somebody to get through in faith. He tells Noah. He says, Noah, it's going to rain. Is it ever? It's going to rain. And so here's the promise. It's going to rain. Here's the command. Build a boat. And it's fascinating to me, too, if you look at it. God did not send the rain until Noah was finished with the boat. It took Noah 120 years. I think probably if Noah had got that boat done in 43 years, God had sent the rain in 43 years. No, God waited because he knew what Noah was able to do. He gave him a big assignment. But God waited, and just as soon as that boat was finished, honey, the storm clouds gathered because Noah had obeyed God. Okay, here's another one. Think about Naaman, the, the leader, the commander of the army who had leprosy. This is all in the Old Testament, 2 Kings. And with Naaman, he has leprosy. He needs a miracle of healing or he's going to die. He goes to Elisha the prophet. Elisha the prophet didn't just touch him and then be healed. What he did was he said, Naaman, you go down to the Jordan River and dip in it seven times. Now, Naaman was aggravated about that. The Bible says that Naaman was like, aren't there enough rivers and ponds and clean water in our country? Why can't I just go to one of their ponds and dip, dip there? Why, do, why can't I just go to my country? Why do I have to go down to the Jordan River, that old dirty, muddy water? I don't even think that Elisha answered him. And the Bible says that Naaman walked away in a rage. He was so mad. He was aggravated. That's not the instruction that he wanted to hear. And it's so funny because the Bible says that Naaman said, I just thought I could go to the prophet, Elisha, and he would just wave his hand over me. Sometimes we just want God to do it the way we want it done. We need a miracle and here's the way I want it done. Just wave your hand. Don't ask nothing of me. I don't want to have to humble myself. I don't want to have to work. I don't want to have to go get dirty. No, that's not what God said. And so his people, his um, employees, so to speak, that worked with him had enough good sense to tell Naaman, Naaman, if Elisha had told you to do something, if Elisha had told you to do something difficult, you'd have done it. You'd have done it. He said, why don't you just go down here and dip in that water? So the Bible says that's what he did. He went and dipped in the Jordan River. And what did he do? What did he do? His miracle didn't come on the fifth time, the sixth time. Nope, the seventh time. When he came up out of that water, the Bible says his skin was like baby skin. See, it was important that he do exactly what God said and exactly the amount of numbers that God told him to do it in. Seven times in the Jordan River. you got to do exactly the way he says it. I could just keep going. I think I will tell you one more. Well, come to think of it. In the book of John, the Bible says that Jesus encounters a blind man. And see, with all these other people that's been healed, the Bible says that he would see the blind man and he would just touch the blind man. He would just touch his eyes and boom, his eyes, their eyes would open. Other times, Jesus would look at people and just speak to them and boom, they'd be healed as soon as he spoke. But not this time. The Bible says this time he sees the blind man and what does Jesus do? He does it different. He spits in the dirt, makes a mud putty out of his spit and puts it on the blind man's eyes. And then tells the blind man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, all he wanted was just to see. And Jesus could have spoken. Why did he do it that way? I don't know. I don't know. And neither did the blind man. But he did what he said. And the Bible says the blind man went and washed and came back seeing. Hallelujah. Because the miracle is often found in our obedience. Now, what if those people, this is, I've written down these words because I heard this for you. Listen and me, preaching to you and me. What if those people we just talked about had not done what God told them to do? What if Moses hadn't lifted that rod? What if Noah hadn't built that boat? I think he'd have died in the flood. What if Naaman hadn't have gone to dip in the Jordan or the blind man in the swamp? I don't think they would have received the manifestation of their miracle. I don't believe so. Now listen to Miss Karen right here, right here. Their miracle was released through their faith that was demonstrated in their obedience. I'll say that again. In all the times of the Bible that God asked anybody to do something before he gave them what they'd asked for. Every time their miracle was released through their faith that was demonstrated in their obedience. Now remember, sometimes God just did it without asking him to do anything. But when he does ask, he means it. There's a reason that you may or may never know on this side of heaven. I don't know. But when he does it, you do it. Remember, their obedience 
was the demonstration of their faith. And it, remember, it is faith that moves God. And what is faith? Remember, let's talk about it. What is faith? Faith is seeing what I cannot see. Faith is believing what I am just hoping for. And I believe it so much that what I'm hoping for is literally substance in my hand. That's how real my faith is to me. I know people think I'm crazy because I see stuff they can't see. But I see it, what I cannot see. I see it. That is faith. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing a word. Oh, I love this. Faith, hand me my Bible. I've got my helpers out here so I can preach with a shovel. Faith comes by hearing a word. Faith is demonstrated by acting on that word. Faith comes by hearing a word. Faith is demonstrated by acting on that word. Now, it was faith. That's what Moses did. Honey, when God told Moses, lift up your rod, it was faith because it made no sense. Do you think, do you think a stick is going to part that water? No, not until God gets in the stick. But when God gets in the stick, honey, anything can happen. All he needs is somebody to co-labor with. And I love it that God didn't have to have everybody. Come on, he didn't have to have all the children of Israel, and there were millions of them. He just had to have one man to believe. If you don't even take your whole family to believe. It doesn't even, if, if, if everybody in your church and your city thinks you're crazy, if you're doing what God says, that's enough. Moses, lift up your rod. Oh, and he lifts up that rod in the water parts. Come on. That was faith. It was faith for Noah to be pounding those pegs in that boat. And people laughing at him saying, you're crazy. That's what faith looks like. He said to do it. He said, water's coming. He said, rain's coming. And I'm building a boat because God said to. That's faith. It was by faith. They received their promise manifested. And Noah saved, the, saved humanity. That's what we talked about last week. Now, just for a quick recap, I'm gonna tell you why I'm here. And I'm gonna tell you a word. You gotta listen because I'm gonna have to give you an assignment today. And it's important for your word. And listen, sweetheart, here's what I think. Because we're friends, I believe there's a reason you're watching this right now, even if we just met for the first time. And I believe the reason you're a front porch friend with me is because, oh, I love this. The promises that God gives me, I can share with you. And even the assignments God gives me, I believe you're supposed to be a part. And we're supposed to do this together. So that's why I feel so strong about you sharing this assignment with me. I believe that's why we're connected, is this is your word too. So the word that God gave you and me last week, remember 2 Kings, third chapter, 1 through 16. And just as a quick, quick recap, remember you had the three kings, King Jehoram, King Jehoshaphat, and the king of the Moabites. No, king of, no, the king of Edom. Jehoram, Jehoshaphat, king of Edom. Those three kings are coming against the king of Moab in a war. They get into the wilderness. They get into the dry place. Seven days with no water. That's a big deal. That's a problem. Not water for them or beast, the Bible says. Now, men start dying when it's been seven days without water. You can go without food, but you can't go without water for very long. Seven days is in a critical situation. Remember what happened? They go to God. Elisha the prophet begins to tell them what God is saying. And God gives them four things. Remember, God said. And, oh, this is important. Listen to me. Listen to me. Get the shovel. I, was, I so appreciated one of you. One of my sweet front porch friends last week commented. And she goes, Miss Karen, the Bible doesn't say that he said dig ditches. It just said he's going to fill the valley with water. And I was, I was so appreciative because I told her, thank you for reminding me. I forgot to tell you last week. That's in the King James Version. For whatever reason, the translators left it out in some of the other translations. I don't know why. But if you go back to the old translation of the King James Version and read that story, the first thing it says that God said was, fill this valley with ditches. So that's where that came from, all right? So it does say that. And it says this. Here's, here's God's word to them. Four things. Here's their instruction. Army dying of thirst. Seven days of no water. Here's your instruction. Now remember too, this didn't happen until they prayed. Here's what God said. Fill the valley with ditches. I'm going to fill the valley with water. And remember, always remember, this is a simple thing for God. And the fourth thing, I'm going to, I'm going to deliver those enemies into your hands. <laughs> this is so powerful. Oh, and I forgot to tell you last week too. 
Do you know how God delivered the enemy into their hands? This was huge and hilarious. So they get their water and the Bible says the next day, the, the Moabites are looking over into the valley where they are and they look and realize the sun, the way the sun was shining on the water, this is God, the way the sun was shining on the water, the water looked like pools of blood. Now that'll preach for another message. The water looked like pools of blood. And the Moabites thought the water, they didn't know it was water, they thought it was blood. And they thought that all those three armies had gotten mad and started fighting each other and killing each other. And they were all about half dead. They thought, oh, this will be an easy victory. We'll just go over there and kill the ones that's left. What they didn't know, <laughs> what they didn't know was when they got over there, the Lord, their God, had refreshed them with water and strengthened them for the fight. They were refreshed by the water they gave. They gave them strength to slaughter their enemies. So the Moabites just walked right into the hands of freshly strengthened men. Glory to God. So God refreshed them and destroyed their enemies through them. Oh, that's what he's going to do through you. Fires my spirit up. Listen to this. Okay, now, this is what we've got to do today. This is our assignment. Are you ready? Remember. First of all, you cannot forget this part. We talked about it, that God did not respond to their need for water until they acknowledged him first. That's huge and important because some people just act like, well, you know, he's sovereign. If he wants to do it, he can do it. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Well, it matters. And that's another message. God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. He does not respond to need so much. He responds to faith. He just let them go until they prayed. When they prayed, he answered. Number two, the next thing, they had a part to play in their miracle. They had a part to play. Sometimes we have a part to play in our miracle. And remember what God said. I'm going to fill this valley with water. The water's coming. And he didn't tell them how it was coming. That's just like him. And he did tell them this. Oh, he's, here's what he did say. I'll tell you this much. It ain't going to come like you think. Now, he didn't tell them how. He just said, it ain't going to come like you think. In other words, you're not going to hear wind or rain because you think that's how it'll come. I ain't going to do it that way. You dig the ditch, and then you'll see how I provide. Just like him. This was important, too. They had to dig the ditches to retain the water for themselves. Okay? This is important right here. Look right here. <coughs> we'll say it again to you from last week. You will only retain what you have prepared to receive. That's my word right now. You will only retain in this situation that you're believing for, you will only retain this blessing's coming. It is coming. And you'll only retain what you have prepared to receive. Had they disobeyed, the water would have come just because God said the water's coming. So they got that much broke through. They got a promise. The water would have come because God said it was coming, but they would have missed it. And don't think you can't miss it because sometimes we act like with the things of God that we can miss it and that we can't miss it. Sometimes we act like, oh, you know, God said it and it's just going to happen. No, if you don't obey God and carry this through, you can miss it. Yes, you can. <coughs> don't, I think right now about Matthew 25, there was 10 virgins who evidently didn't think they could miss him. I know that's for a different point in the Bible, but it works here too. Ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish. Five prepared, five didn't. The promise was manifested, the bridegroom came, five were ready, five were not, and they missed it. So sometimes we can have a promise, but if we don't carry that, that word through to the end, we won't walk in the fullness of our promise, and we can miss it, and you can and disobedience is costly. Oh, sweet friend, I want you to listen. I've learned this. I know disobedience is costly. And far too often, we walk in disobedience and then blame God for the consequences. I'm going to say that again. We walk in disobedience and then blame God for the consequences. God, you promised. Where's the promise? God, Where's the provision? I've been praying for months and weeks and years for the provision. Where's God? Where are why? Why aren't you coming through? God, why haven't you done this? And I think sometimes it was looking back at us going, why haven't you obeyed? 
Why haven't you obeyed? His promise still stands. But there could be between the promise and you, especially if you're having, because sometimes, like I said, God, you'll ask, boom, you get it, and that's my favorite. But sometimes, if it's been a minute, it's a good thing to go, now, did he tell me something to do that I've missed here that I have not acted on? Because sometimes it can be the key. The need for water was great for those men. Seven days, oh, sweet friend, seven days without water. They were getting ready to die. Those men for that long, they were getting ready to die. But the Bible says when they dug the ditches, they must have dug all night. Because the Bible says the next day, sounds like about a 24 hour day, the sunset, right the next day, suddenly the water appears and it just comes gushing into the valley. Where was the source? Just God. It just started, the Bible says that the water just started gushing through the valley and filling up the valley. And you look at that and you think, why did they receive the water so quickly? They just prayed and boom, they got the water with us suddenly. You know why I believe they got the water so quickly? They obeyed so quickly. They obeyed quickly. Because they obeyed quickly and passionately. For these men, honey, it was dig or die. For these men, they knew they got to dig or they're going to die. And whenever, whenever it's dig or die, you don't dig passively. Whenever it's dig or die, you don't procrastinate. You don't say, well, I know I'm thirsty, but he said waters are coming. And if I'm just, I'm awful tired now. And I, maybe if I just wait a day or two. No, honey, when it's dig or die and you know that you may not make it one more day, if you don't get water, you're going to dig like you mean it. You're going to dig with passion if you believe the word of God. When it's dig or die, things are different. When the promise of God, listen to Miss Karen right now, when the promise of God is your only hope, you'll dig different. When the promise of God is your only hope, you'll dig different. And can I tell you, the water is our only hope. The water, the promised water from God for us today in 2023 is our only hope. The water is the only hope for your nation and for America too, believe me. The water is the only hope for your city. The water is the only hope for your family. The water is the only hope for the addicted. The water is the only hope for the gender confused. The water is the only hope for the cutter and the alcoholic. And we've got to dig like we believe that. The water is the only hope for your prodigal. Mom and dad, you've got to keep digging like you believe. You've got to keep digging like you believe. The water getting to your prodigal or your prodigal getting to the water is their only hope. Isaiah 44, 3, God promised us this. Come on, sweetheart. In Isaiah 44, 3, we talked about it a few weeks ago. In Isaiah 44, 3, he promised, he said, I will pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And oh, this generation is thirsty and our nation is dry ground. But look at the rest of this promise in Isaiah 44, 3. I just saw it today. Here's the rest of that verse. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. <sighs> Believing for a prodigal, there's your promise. The water's coming and he's ready and willing to pour it out if you'll believe it. And he's going to pour out a blessing on your descendants and his spirit on your offspring. We have to have the water. We've just got to keep digging. And here's where I'm going to close. But listen to me, sweetheart. What does it look like? What does it look like to dig? I talked about it a little bit last week. I'm going to remind you again. This is what God's dealing with me about. Do you remember two years ago? Two years ago. The Lord said to me and to you, me to us. What I've told you to do, do it now. Time is of the essence. What does it look like to dig? It looks like doing what he's told you to do. That's what digging is. Digging looks like doing everything that God, it may be practical, it may be spiritual. If you're believing for something spiritual to, to come through in your life, and it hasn't come through, you need to stop and go, Lord, do I need to dig out some unforgiveness? Is that unforgiveness in the way? of my answer. God, I got to get rid of this unforgiveness. Is it envy? 
Have you been harboring envy towards somebody? And that's keeping your blessing. Lord, if it's envy, that's got to go. Come on, come, sometimes digging is spiritual digging. I got to get rid of this competitive spirit in me. I got to get rid of this old complaining spirit in me. Come on, is it sin? Is it compromise? Come on, you got to say, God, you've dealt with me about laying that thing down and it's sin in my life and it's going to go. I'm going to dig out this junk. Anything in the way of my miracle has got to go. That compromise has got to go. Come on, that clutter, it's got to go. Those distractions with, with too much cell phone time, that's got to go because it's stealing my focus and it's stopping my miracle. Come on, you got to say that junk is moved. That's digging. That's digging, getting it out of the way. Anything, you get everything that's out of the way. You, let me say it again. You get everything that's in the way out of the way. Everything that's in the way. I don't even know what time it is. Have I been up too long? <laughs> I love this, and this is what God's telling me. Do everything you can do, and then God will do everything he can do. I want you to hear that from the Lord's heart. Do everything you can do, and God's gonna do everything he can do. You believe for a new house? Clean out the old one. Get it in order. Get ready. Just start taking care of the one you've got and getting it cleaned out and getting it in order, believing for the new one. You believing for financial provision? Get your personal finances in order. Just get everything in order that you can do, believing for the greater to come. You believing for a baby? Go get that nursery ready. Get those baby clothes bought. Do something. Just do what he tells you to do. You got to do. I'm, I'm telling. I'm listen. For me, I'm gonna tell you what I'm, I'm. What he's telling me to do. That's why I'm over here. You know. And this, the reason I'm doing this is I, I, I love to agree with you. I want you to stand with me. I'm, you know, this shopping center right here. This is why I'm over here. I believe in God. I believe in God at this ministry to renovate this shopping center, like I've told you, into a school of the arts down here for singers, dancers, theater, uh, musicians, media, all things down here, training young people to preach the gospel with their gifts to glorify God. I need a new auditorium here to put young people in because we're out of room at the ramp. Every conference this summer has hundreds of kids on the waiting list. I wanna be able to get all these hungry, thirsty kids in this building. So I, I can more than double the amount of kids in this building right here. I felt like the Lord said, Karen, your ditch right now is to go to that shopping center. That's why I'm doing it, come down here. I'll show you what I'm doing. This is how I'm digging my ditch. I'm going in here and I'm gonna start cleaning out everything that's in the way. Now, I've gotta have a miracle financially. So that's what I'm asking God for. Because God alone will provide the money to build this. He alone. And he knows where it is. And so I think my part right now is to do the, everything I can do. And get. I've got the ramp people down here helping me. And I told them, y'all just come take everything out of here that's in the way. Because we're going to start getting ready to build. Where's the money coming from, Karen? It's on the other side of our obedience. I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to do everything I can do. I'm going to get this thing cleaned out. We're going to start knocking down the walls, and we'll get some men in here, and we're just going to knock down all the walls that we can knock down. Everything we can do in our strength, and our power, this is my ditch. We're going to clean it out. We're going to empty it out. We're going to get this junk out of here, and then we're going to just knock down the walls, get ready to start building them. Where's the money going to come from? I'm going to stand right here and do everything that we can do. We're going to knock it out, clean it out, clean it out, getting it out, getting it out, cleaning it out. Then once I've done everything I can do, I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to look up at that blue sky. And I'm going to see right through it and see into the throne room of my father and say, Father, I've done my part. And I know you'll be faithful to do yours. I've done everything I can do. And now, God, you will glorify your name. You will glorify your name and provide a place for young people to come. Because, oh, they're coming. Oh, they're coming. I believe it. This past week, the Lord had me to watch that movie again, Filled of Dreams. And he reminded me of that word that he gave. In, 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 I mean, I heard it as a word from the Lord. Maybe they didn't mean it that way. But in that movie, he said, if you build it, they will come. Or he will come. I believe that. I believe when we build it, he will come. 
And when he comes, they will come. And I hear them coming. I hear young people coming from all over the world. Why? Because they've heard he's here. I've, I hear these young people coming like in the far distance. I hear this generation coming thirsty. They're coming desperate. They're coming knowing they've got to have water. And they're coming knowing and saying, I've heard there's water there. I've heard he's there. Because if we build it, he will come. And if he comes, they will come. And they are coming. They are coming, my friend. So that's what God's told me to do. And now I'm asking you, what has he told you to do? Let's do this together. Let's do this together. I want you to do this. Here's your assignment. Okay? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm on this thing, and I'm not stopping till it's finished. I'm doing some things personally at my own house, but I'm doing it in God's house. I mean, cleaning out practically, spiritually, whatever it takes. Doing everything. I want you to do, what has he told you to do? Go do it. And do it today. Start on it right now. It may be hard and dirty. Go do it anyway. There's no time to waste. What God said to us was what I've told you to do. Do it now. Time is of the essence. So time is of the essence for us. Why? There's a thirsty world that's got to have water. And we are the only hope. That no, God is the only hope. And we have that hope. Now, I want you the comments to do this assignment. Normally, I have you to write down what you're believing for. This is what I want you to do. It may take you a second, but do it anyway. You just do it in two sentences. If you'd be willing to share with us, I've shared with you what I'm doing. I want you to share what God has told you to do and what you're doing. Maybe it's just like he's told me to, you know, um, he wants to provide a financial miracle and then say, I'm getting my finances in order. Or maybe he's told you, my, he's told me my prodigal's coming home. And maybe you say, I'm getting everything out of the way, any unforgiveness, anything, just whatever it is. Just write down what he's told you to do and then write down what you are doing. Will you do that? And I just, well, why are you doing that, Karen? I think it's just good for all of us to hold each other accountable. Like if you look at your comment written down there and I'm gonna be reading as many as, as I can, it's just all of us, it's like we're all coming into agreement and we've all got our shovels and we're all doing this together. Now, Lord, I thank you that today you are with all of us in this word. And Lord, we're excited because we believe on the other side of our obedience is the miracle we've been believing for. We're trusting you, God, our ears are open. And for those of you that's needing to know clearly what you're saying, help them hear you. We love you, God. We breathe and live for you forever. We live to glorify your name. <coughs> In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. I love you, my sweet friend. I'm believing for great things this week. I want to hear from you soon. Share this with a friend. Till then, I'm going to keep digging till I see you again.